So let us now move to unfair labor practices. Unfair labor practices are acts that violate the right to self-organization. It does not refer to every unfair act or decision of an employer or labor organization. It refers only to those acts listed in Articles 259 and 260 of the Labor Code. So, without this element of self-organization, the acts, no matter how unfair, cannot be considered as unfair labor practice. So, if you are confronted with a problem that calls for the application of the principles of unfair labor practice, analyze the problem and determine whether self-organization is involved. If there is a violation of the right to self-organization, then there is unfair labor practice. Otherwise, there is none. So, who can commit unfair labor practice? Well, unfair labor practices can be committed by employers and labor organizations. And against whom can unfair labor practice be committed? Well, unfair labor practices can be committed only against an employee who exercises or has exercised his right to self-organization because unfair labor practices are acts that violate the right to self-organization. So, therefore, unfair labor practices cannot be committed against an employee who is not connected with any labor organization or who has not assisted or contributed to the formation of a labor organization. It cannot be committed against an employee who has not attempted to join a labor organization. And it cannot be committed against an employee who is disqualified from forming or joining a labor organization, like managerial employees or confidential employees with access to labor relations information. Unfair labor practices have two aspects. The administrative aspect and the criminal aspect. Now, who has jurisdiction over the administrative aspect? Well, uh, the administrative aspect of unfair labor practices is under the jurisdiction of the labor arbiters of the NLRC, while the criminal aspect falls under the concurrent jurisdiction of the Municipal or Metropolitan Trial Court and the Regional Trial Court. Now, when is the proper time to file the criminal case for ULP? Well, the proper time is only when there is a final judgment in the administrative proceedings declaring that unfair labor practice has been committed. So, therefore, the criminal aspect of unfair labor practice cannot be filed without filing the administrative case. The criminal aspect of unfair labor practice cannot be filed simultaneously with the administrative case. Likewise, the criminal aspect, the criminal case for unfair labor practice cannot be filed prior to the finality of the decision in the administrative case. The criminal aspect cannot be filed if the final decision in the administrative case does not declare that unfair labor practice has been committed. Can the judgment in the administrative case declaring that unfair labor practice has been committed be used as evidence of guilt in the criminal case? The answer is no. The final judgment in the administrative proceedings declaring that unfair labor practice was committed cannot be used as evidence of guilt in the criminal case. So what is the probative value of such decision? Well, the decision in the administrative case can only be used as proof of compliance with the procedural requirements for filing of the criminal case. Along procedural requirements? Well, proof that there is a final judgment in the administrative case declaring that unfair labor practice has been committed. So I repeat, the uh, administrative judgment cannot be used as evidence of guilt in the criminal case. Why is that so? Because of the difference in the degree of proof. As you already know, the degree of evidence required in administrative cases is, is substantial evidence. <clears throat> but in criminal cases, it is proof beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, that's why the administrative judgment, even if it declares that unfair labor practice has been committed, cannot be used as evidence of guilt in the criminal case. Now, let's now go to the prescriptive period of unfair labor practice. 
For the administrative aspect, the prescriptive period is one year from commission. Now, for the criminal aspect, the prescriptive period is also one year, but the reckoning period is not the same. The one-year period is reckoned from the finality of the judgment in the administrative case because the prescriptive period does not run during the pendency of the administrative proceedings. Let us now go to the unfair labor practices of employers. First is interference, restraint, or coercion. It shall be unlawful for an employer to restrain or coerce employees in the exercise of the right to self-organization. The test of interference, restraint, or coercion is whether the employer has committed acts which tend to hinder the free exercise of the right to self-organization. Mere attempt to curtail or stifle the right of workers to organize or join a union is already considered as unfair labor practice. A success of a purpose is not a criterion in determining whether unfair labor practice has been committed. So interference will not be negated by the fact that the employer's conduct was susceptible of being resisted. The employer's motive is a relevant factor in determining whether unfair labor practice has been committed. If it is proven that the true and basic inspiration for the employer's act is derived from the employee's union activities, the employer cannot escape liability for unfair labor practice. Even if the employer will ascribe misconduct to the employee, this circumstance alone will not absolve the employer of the ability for unfair labor practice if it is proven that the misconduct was merely used to give semblance of validity to the dismissal. And the case of uh, Visayan Bicycle is illustrative. Now, in this case, the vice president and secretary of the union were instrumental in affiliating the union with a federation. Now, when this came to the knowledge of the company, they were warned that if they will not withdraw the affiliation, they will be dismissed from their employment. And true enough, they were later dismissed from their employment for figuring on, on the same day in a fight with two newly hired employees. Now, it was established that the vice president and the secretary of the union were provoked by the two newly hired employees into a prearranged fight pursuant to the strategy of the company to give semblance of a lawful cause for their dismissal. The Supreme Court ruled that the company is guilty of unfair labor practice because the fighting was brought about by the company itself to give semblance of lawful cause for their dismissal. Next, the unfair labor practice is requiring an employee not to join a union. The law says that it is unlawful for an employer to require as a condition of employment that a person or an employee shall not join a labor organization or shall withdraw from one to which he belongs. An employer commits unfair labor practice if it requires employees or applicants for employment to declare that they are not members of a labor union, to refrain from joining a labor union, to withdraw their membership in a labor union, or to resign from the company if they will not withdraw their union membership. A contract which um, contains the said uh, stipulation is called a yellow dog contract. This is uh, illustrated by the case of uh, Veles versus PAV Watchmen's Union. In this case, the employer asked the employee whether he was a member of the union. And when the employee replied in the uh, affirmative, the employer bade him to resign from the union because it was the only way to show his loyalty. Fearing to lose his job, the employee signed a prepared resignation paper. The Supreme Court ruled that the company is guilty of unfair labor practice because the uh, employer required his employee to resign from the union as a condition for continued employment. Next is contracting out services performed by union members. The law says that it shall be unlawful for an employer to contract out services or functions performed by union members when such will interfere with, restrain, or coerce employees in the exercise of the right to self-organization. I want you to remember that contracting out services performed by unions is not 
uh, unfair labor practice per se. It will become unfair labor practice only when it interferes with, restrains, or coerces employees in the exercise of the right to self-organization. Next, unfair labor practice is organizing or assisting in organizing a union. The law says that it shall be unlawful for an employer to initiate, nominate, assist, or otherwise interfere with the formation or administration of any labor organization, including the giving of financial or other support to its organizers or uh, supporters. A labor organization, the formation of which has been initiated or assisted by the employer, is called a company union. You will notice that uh, the, the mere act of support, uh, supporting the union or its organizer is considered as unfair labor practice. And the support need not be financial. It could be in the form of uh, special privileges, like uh, uh, allowing the use of company facilities. Next is discrimination. The law says that it shall be unlawful for an employer to discriminate in regard to wages, hours of work, and other terms and conditions of employment in order to encourage or discourage membership in any labor organization. If you will analyze the provision, you will note that discrimination becomes unfair labor practice only when it is intended to encourage or discourage membership in any labor organization. So discrimination by itself is not unfair labor practice. It will become unfair labor practice only when it is intended to encourage or discourage membership in any labor organization. Next is uh, dismissal for testifying against the employer. The law says it shall be unlawful for an employer to dismiss uh, or discriminate against an employee for having given or being about to give testimony under this code. Just remember that to constitute unfair labor practice under this, this provision, the testimony should relate to matters that pertain to the exercise of the right to self-organization, such as testimony in another unfair labor practice case, or testimony in an illegal strike case, or testimony in, an, in a labor injunction case, or in a certification election proceeding. The reason for this is because the essential element of uh, unfair labor practice is self-organization, considering that unfair labor practices are acts that violate the right to self-organization. So that means that an employer does not commit unfair labor practice if it dismisses an employee because of adverse testimony in a case that has nothing to do with self-organization. Next, unfair labor practice is violation of the duty to bargain. The law says that it shall be unlawful for an employer to violate the duty to bargain collectively. What is the meaning of the duty to bargain collectively? Well, the duty to bargain collectively refers to the obligation of one party to sit down with the other party to negotiate in good faith the terms of the CBA. Now, to be liable for violation of the duty to bargain collectively, the obligation to bargain must exist. Now, in so far as the employer is concerned, the obligation to bargain collectively will exist when the union which seeks to bargain collectively with the employer is a legitimate labor organization. This means that the union must be registered with the Department of Labor, or at least affiliated with a duly re registered federation or national union. So if the uh, labor organization is not registered or affiliated with a duly re registered uh, federation or national union, the employer is not under obligation to bargain collectively. Why, why is that so? Well, the reason is because an unregistered union has no legal personality. Second point that you should remember is that the uh, union which uh, seeks to bargain collectively with the employer must be composed of employees of the supposed employer. So where a party is neither an employer nor an employee of the other, the duty to bargain collectively does not exist. So if the union is composed of employees of the independent contractor, the principal is not obliged to bargain collectively because in a valid contracting arrangement, employer-employee relationship does not exist between the principal and the employees of the contractor. 
third point that you, you should uh, remember is that the union must be chosen or designated by the majority of the employees within their bargaining unit as their bargaining representative. So, if there are two or more unions who claim to hold the majority of the employees, the duty to bargain does not exist until the issue on majority representation is finally settled. And lastly, you must remember that for the duty to bargain collectively to exist, the union must be certified by the Department of Labor as the bargaining agent of the employees. So this means that the union must undergo cert- the, the certification process, either by SEBA certification or certification election. So if the union, even though it is a leg- legitimate labor organization, which seeks to bargain on behalf of the employees, is not certified as bargaining agent, the employer has no obligation to bargain collectively. Next, unfair labor practice is paying negotiation or attorney's fees to the union. The law says that it shall be unlawful for an employer to pay negotiation fees or attorney's fees to the union uh, as part of the settlement of any issue in collective bargaining or in any other dispute. This is unfair labor practice because the act of paying negotiation fees or attorney's fees to the union or its officer as part of settlement of bargaining issues compromises the right of employees to bargain collectively under an atmosphere of freedom and mutual respect. Paying negotiation fees or attorney's fees to the union is a bribe which could entice the union to follow the wishes of the employer at the expense of employees whom it represents. And next is violation of the CBA. The law says that it shall be unlawful for an employer to violate a collective bargaining agreement. So I want you to remember that to constitute unfair labor practice, the violation of the CBA must be gross in character. Must be gross in character. And what does gross violation of the CBA mean? Well, gross violation of the CBA means flagrant or malicious refusal to comply with the economic provisions. Economic provisions. So, how do we know that a CBA provision is an economic provision? Well, economic provisions pertain to wages and benefits, such as bonuses, sick leave, vacation leave, with or without pay, as distinguished from non-economic provisions. Non-economic provisions pertain to matters that do not touch on benefits or wages. Uh, Example, composition of the bargaining unit. Managerial prerogatives, union security, check off, uh, grievance machinery, or no strike, no lockout provision. Uh, those are non economic provisions. So, what are the points that you should remember on this provision? Well, first is that the violation of the CBA must pertain to an economic provision. Economic. So, that means that the violation of a non economic provision is not unfair labor practice. What would be the recourse of employees under that situation? Well, the recourse would be to avail of the grievance machinery in the CBA. Now, second point that you should remember is that the violation of the economic provision must be malicious or blatant. Malicious or blatant. So this means that honest mistake in interpreting or implementing an economic provision cannot be considered as unfair labor practice. Because honest mistake is not malicious or blatant. Let us now move to unfair labor practices of uh, labor organizations. Well, the first is uh, restraint or coercion of employees. The law says it shall be an unfair labor practice for a labor organization to restrain or coerce employees in the exercise of the rights to self-organization. Examples of restraint would be if the union recommends to the employer the dismissal of an employee who resigned from the union during the freedom period. Uh, The reason for this is because there is restraint on the right of employees to self-organization considering that it seeks to deprive the employee of his employment even though the resignation from the union was done during the freedom period. Another example would be when a union expels a member who initiated the filing of a petition for audit of union funds. 
This is a restraint because the expulsion restrains the right of the union members to ask for audit of union funds. Next, unfair labor practice of labor organization is causing an employer to discriminate against an employee. Now, the law says it shall be unfair labor practice for a labor organization to cause or attempt to cause an employer to discriminate against an employee. Next is violation of the duty to bargain collectively. The law says that it shall be unfair labor practice for a labor organization to violate the duty or to refuse to bargain collectively, provided that it is the representative of the employees. To be liable for violation of the duty to bargain collectively, the obligation to bargain collectively must exist. Now, insofar as the union is concerned, the duty to bargain collectively attaches only when it is certified as the bargaining agent. Next, unfair labor practice is causing an employer to pay for services not performed. The law says that it shall be unfair labor practice for a labor organization cause or attempt to cause an employer to pay or deliver or agree to pay or deliver any money or other things of value for services not performed. Under this provision, considered as unfair labor practice are demanding a negotiation fee from the employer and causing an employer to pay in cash or in kind for services not rendered. And mere attempt to cause an employer to pay in cash or in kind for services not rendered is considered as unfair labor practice. Because the liability for unfair labor practice under this provision is not dependent on whether the union succeeded in prevailing upon the employer to commit such prohibited act. Next, unfair labor practice of labor organization is asking or accepting negotiation fees. Under this provision, if a labor organization asks an employer to give negotiation fees, or attorney's fees, it is guilty of unfair labor practice, regardless of whether the proposal was accepted by the employer. Now, if the employer agrees to the proposal and gives negotiation or attorney's fees to the labor organization, then it is equally guilty of unfair labor practice. If the labor organization did not ask for negotiation fees, but nevertheless accepted such fees from the employer, then it is still guilty of unfair labor practice. And lastly, a violation of CBA. It shall be unfair labor practice for a labor organization to violate a collective bargaining agreement. As I have told you earlier, to constitute unfair labor practice, the breach of the CBA must be gross in character, which means flagrant or malicious refusal to comply with economic provisions. 